you had only one skill, if you had to only master one skill to get anything you want in life, it would be this one, persuasion. Think about it. If you can get anyone to do anything you want, you would get anything you want out of life. You would be able to close a deal with a billionaire. If you see a beautiful lady, you would be able to... <laughs> I mean, you, you, you see what I mean? Persuasion is the most important skill that you can develop. And in this video, we are going to review the six principles of persuasion outlined in the book Influence by Robert Cialdini. If you don't know Robert Cialdini, this is a well-known psychologist, author, researcher, who is best known for his work in the field of social influence and persuasion. In this video, I'm going to give you concrete example of how I use those six principles in my career as a commodity trader. You can do it too. According to Cialdini, it's possible to use the human desire for reciprocity to influence behaviors. He states that people feel obligated to repay others for what they have received. In other words, when someone does something nice for us, we feel a social obligation to do something nice in return. Reciprocity is a powerful tool of persuasion, as it can be used to create a sense of obligation in others. Let me start with a little story um, that happened to me during my career. At my first company, uh, I had a client in Senegal. Um, that was a small client. I think we did maybe only two containers together. I mean, that, that was a really small client, but a, a really nice one. I, I like the guy. And one day he asked me to issue an invitation letter for one of his employees. Because maybe you don't know that, but in many countries, if you want to get a visa, you need someone that issue an invitation letter to you. The lady was from Senegal and she wanted to get uh, to come to Switzerland. It was not really business related. So I said, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we did that for other clients. So I was like, no problem. So um, I issued the letter. I went to see my boss. Uh, and at the time I had maybe 25 years old. That was really my first year that I was closing deal, so that I was a proper trader. And I have no uh, power of signature in the company. So everything is, must be signed by my boss. So I came to the tour and said, uh, look, this is the invitation letter. This is for my uh, new client. And she said, uh, no, no, Damien. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what? Why? Um, and she said, no, I don't know the, your client. I mean, this is a very small client. We are not going to issue invitation letter for everyone. Uh, no. So I was like, uh, OK, <laughs> uh, but it's just a letter. <laughs> Come on. And anyway, so she said no. So I came back to my desk. I was like, oh, what, what should I do? And you know, this is when I knew that I was going to employee my whole life because it was my real my, my real time that I was really a trader. I mean, this is what I wanted to, to do for like five years. I said like, <laughs> I took the letter, I sent it myself and then I scanned it and then I, I sent it for my, my personal email. I said to my clients, look, uh, my company usually don't do invitation letter. My boss said, said no. So I, I did it by myself. Please make sure that nothing bad happened. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to get fired. So please, man, be, be cool. And he said, oh, thank you, Damien, thank you, Damien. So because of this story, this little letter that cost me nothing to do. And seriously, what is the liability of an invitation letter? It's zero, to be honest. But anyway, because of that, I made 10,000 of US dollar of margin with that client. Cialdini argues that scarcity creates a sense of urgency, causing people to act quickly in order to acquire the scarce resource. This is because people fear missing out on an opportunity or losing something that is valuable. This is why diamonds are valuable, because the supply is regulated by the debair. Or when a product is on a special discount, it flies out of the shell, because people are afraid of losing the opportunity to buy it at that discounted price. Scarcity, easy to understand. When something is scarce, people want it more. And the following part is not going to be Robert Cialdini theory, but it's going to be a theory of mine. So uh, please, if you think that what I'm going to say next is completely uh, stupid, <laughs> leave a comment below. Or if you agree with me, also leave a comment below. So my theory is that scarcity is what makes bull market the easiest market for physical commodity traders. Because think about it, your client is in a hurry to buy because tomorrow, the price is more likely going to be higher. So he doesn't want to lose the opportunity to buy it at a cheaper price. So this is why everything is easier in a bull market. The first bull market that I experienced as a commodity trader was the skimmed milk powder 
market from 2012 to 2014. Oh yes, I was a, a dairy trader. <laughs> and if you are wondering, being a dairy trader doesn't help you to, to pull off girls. Huh? This, it doesn't work. You need to be an oil trader or something like this. The price shoot up from 2000 euro per metric ton to 3500 metric ton in a couple of years. It was wild. It was wild. It was wild. It was so easy to make deals. I mean, everyone was scrambling to get their hands on skim and milk powder. A lot of new incomers in the market was ready to, to buy anything just to make a quick buck. That was wild. That was so easy to close deal. Then, of course, the bear market uh, hit. That was not uh, so fun anymore. <laughs> The authority principle is the idea that people tend to follow and obey individuals who are perceived as authoritative or credible. According to Cialdini, authority can come from a variety of sources such as expertise, brand, experience or position. Authority works because people put fewer filters and accept more easily something as true from an authoritative figure. So if you cut yourself and a doctor said, oh, you need to do this and that, there is a good chance that you will follow what he says. But if you cut yourself in a bar and you have a drunken colleague that said, ah, you need to do this to heal it, and you are not going to accept as easily what he just said, even though he said the exact same thing as, a, as the doctor. Let's take another example. Let's say that you are trying to negotiate with a counterparty and that uh, Mark Rich is coming and uh, give you advice on how to navigate uh, and close this deal. What are you going to do? Now let's say that there is like a junior employee that has been there for like six months uh, that is going to give you the exact same advice. What are you going to do? Of course, <laughs> you will listen to Mark Rich and maybe not to the junior guys, even though they said the same thing. How did I use it during my career? So it was quite simple. I established my credibility, my authority from what I've done. My track record is why you could believe me. And it was really simple to do it. So when I was on the phone with a client, a lead or whatever, I always spoke about the previous deal that I have done. I was like, oh yeah, I closed, uh, last week I closed 200 metric ton uh, to uh, a factory in Niger. Then, uh, yeah, we, we closed uh, this fat field milk powder. Uh, it's a special blend to uh, Malaysia, whatever, whatever. I mean, I always spoke about the, the, the past deal that I closed. And this is something that I did naturally because I understood at that moment that people wanted to deal with winner, you know? <laughs> and even one day, there's one of my colleagues, uh, she said like, why, Damien, do you always have to brag on the phone about your past deal? It feels like so small <laughs> energy. <laughs> and I remember that I was like, just, no, I'm not bragging, I'm selling. At the time, I couldn't understand that what I was doing was basically displaying authority and social proof <laughs> that basically what I was doing. <laughs> According to Cialdini, social proof can be a powerful motivator because people have a natural desire to fit in and belong to a group. People tend to assume that the actions and behaviors of others reflect the correct way to behave in a particular situation. People look at other people for cues. This is how you learn to be a human. And people that have children will tell you. This is how children learn. They look at what others are doing and just copy it. I use social proof in a lot of different ways uh, in my career, but here are the two that uh, come to my mind. At one of my previous company, we always exhibit at the Dubai Gulf Food Fair. This is one of the biggest uh, food fair in the world. And I noticed that a full booth always got more attention and more people than an empty booth. I mean, actually, this is the same principle in a restaurant. So a restaurant, we always put the first people that come in, in front of the door, so then uh, when you are working outside the restaurant, you can see that there's people inside this restaurant that so you are more likely to get in. And this is the same idea that I, I did with, with my booth. I've always did my best to attract people so then more people will come. And the other way that I use social proof is that I would always name drop big companies' name. So, oh yeah, we did a, a deal with uh, this uh, big producer. Or, oh yeah, this uh, big buyer, so we ship them. Uh, I don't know, 10,000 metric tons last month or something like this. I've always name dropped big names because, I, again, I knew that uh, people want to work with people that work with big names. That, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and as also my company was not like uh, very well known. A small company, quite well known in this niche market, but not on a global basis. So 
uh, we, we have to fight for deals. And one way to, to do it is just to put yourself uh, at the same level of the obese guy. Them drop big names. This principle suggests that people have a strong desire to be seen as consistent and will often align their behaviors and beliefs with what they have said or done in the past. According to Sheldini, consistency can be a powerful motivator because it creates a sense of identity and self-image. People tend to define themselves by their belief and action and will often behave in the way that are consistent with their self-image. In other words, this is a concept of small step or foot in the door. You ask for something small first, so then you can ask for something bigger in the future. They did an experience where they asked a bunch of people to uh, put a small sign in their garden in front of a road. And I think the sign said something like, oh, please uh, drive slowly or, so or something like this. So they went to a bunch of people, they asked to put uh, the small sign. And one week later, they came back with a bigger sign and asked the same people to put the bigger sign instead of the small one. And most of the people said, uh, yeah, no problem. Then they took another bunch of, uh, of people and directly asked to put the big sign in their garden. And here, most of the people said no. Nobody wants to be known as inconsistent, chaotic, erratic. Um, those are bad threats. So I use this principle in deal making the following way. And I still use it uh, to this day, so this is good. I try to make my leads or my client self-label themselves in three different ways. So I will try to make them say three different things about themselves. The first one is that they are someone trustworthy. Yes, uh, I'm a man of one word. So when I say something, it means something you can trust me. Then I always try to make them say that they are not there for a spot deal, that they are there to build a long lasting business relationship with me. So I will try to have them say, yes, yes, I'm, the, I'm here to, I'm only looking to get few suppliers and I want to work with them for the 10 next year. This is, this is what I want to be. The third point is I'm trying to make them say that they are not a joker, they are not there just to check and see what is going on, but they are here and they mean business. They are here to close a deal and they had a need to close that deal. So once I achieve it, I will try to positively reinforce everything that they said to me that would fall in those buckets. For instance, let's say that uh, they say, I mean, during the conversation, they speak about something that they did in the past. And then we say, oh yeah, so you do are someone of one word. So, you, I mean, you are someone trustworthy. This story just uh, show it. Of course, I try to be a little bit more smooth than that, but <laughs> you get the idea. So basically, you will try to reinforce any positive uh, label th that they put on themselves and that you want them to, to have. Then when you send your offer to close a deal, you have a lot of ammo that, that you can use to, to close it. Hey, but I'm sorry, but you told me that you are there to, to build a long lasting relationship with our company. So, and after the first deal, now you want to go to another supplier and we have the same price. So please explain to me. I'm sorry, but why should I wait to close the deal? The price is for today. Tomorrow it's going to be another price. And the last time we spoke, you said that you were here to close a deal, not to waste any one time. I gave you the best price at this market level. And yesterday you told me that if I was able to do so, you were going to close. So why aren't you closing? Hey, if you are still watching this video and want to learn more technique like this, you must be someone interested in becoming the best commodity salesman ever. For that, I have a short course called Commodity Sales Trading Attestation. First thing in the description below this video. The liking principle is the idea that people are more likely to be influenced by those they like or find attractive. According to Sheldini, liking can be influenced by a variety of factors such as physical attractiveness, similarity and compliments. People tend to like others who share similar interests and backgrounds or give them compliments and praise. Here we are going to see a clip from my first million podcast where they interview a former uh, broker. It's not a commodity broker, it's a financial broker, let's say, the guy working in a bank. But I think it's a fun so let's watch it. How are you making that much money? That's just commissions or uh, yeah, what, so, what, what so, goes into that? How do you jump from like 80K to 2 million? What, what, <laughs> what happened? Yeah, good question. So um, I was brokering um, electricity trades and electricity deregulation had just taken place. So you're putting together trades for like commodities trade on monthly contracts. So we were doing that. And um, 
when Enron went went bust, I got basically sent from New York, from at London back to New York because the business had dried up. But I was like one of the biggest producers of commissions at the time. Again, like I was so unqualified. I didn't know anything about the technicalities of what we were doing. I just knew how to find buyers and sellers. It could have been houses. It could have been baseball cards. I just was had a knack for it. Is that like so when, networking? Is it cold yes. calling? What were you What were you doing to actually be great? What did it take to be great there? Um, so I had this ability to connect with people. So when Enron went bust, they sent me back to New York. And again, talking about reinventing yourself, Enron goes down, I'm making a ton of money. And these businesses like Cantor Fitzgerald, investment banks, et cetera, they're ruthless. So the minute shit went sideways with electricity trading, they were like, okay, we'll send you back to New York. And this was, I lived in London during 9-11 and Cantor was on the top floor of the World Trade Center. So when we lost 3000 people, they sent me back to New York and said, hey, can you take over our credit derivatives business, which happened to be the most lucrative business in the in the institution at the time. Now, if I didn't know anything about electricity, you can imagine how little I knew about credit derivatives. I knew less than nothing. I knew as much as a plumber would know. But I knew people and I knew the lingo. And I just, I picked up the phone and just, in hindsight, I don't even know. I had a, I developed a relationship with, a guy who's still one of my really good friends called Colin Stewart, who worked at Morgan Stanley, who happened to be a huge trader of these things. And the market was so new, the credit derivatives, and we just hit it off again, just became friendly. We went skiing a couple of times and um, he started to just do a ton of business with me. And at the time when a product is new, the commissions tend to be big until people realize how much they're paying on an annual, monthly or annual basis. But I can remember one time for context, and again, I'm only sharing these numbers because of the, for context of the podcast, I, I, I don't want to come across like, hey, look at me, how much money I'm making because. Hey, I, our podcast is called, it's called My First Million, you're all right. <laughs> all right. So I'm on a trading desk. There's a group of credit derivative brokers, just generic credit derivatives. I was trading credit derivative, like correlation products, like super sophisticated, high-end bespoke one-off trades. So the credit derivative desk has like 12 guys. And that was like the product du jour. Everyone wanted to be in credit derivatives. It was jamming. They were ba credit derivative. Basically think of it as an option on a bond. So these guys were jamming and we had a super busy day one day. Everyone did. And the kid who ran the, the CDS credit default swap desk says to me, dude, we had a huge day. We made 250,000 in commissions between like 10, 15 guys. So I said, hold on, let me see. And I start telling up thing. I go, oh dude, I, I was a one man show. I said, I did uh, 262,000 in total commissions. And I think I was keeping like either 50 or 60% of that in one day. So did you see this guy made so much money because he was able to get friends. So basically he became friends with his counterparties. And when you have a choice between bank A, bank B, bank C, you are going to deal with uh, your friend at bank A. That's it. People like to do business with their friends. Of course, all of those techniques are very difficult to apply all of them at once. I mean, you need to practice and so on. But I'm pretty sure that if you are already good with people, if you are already great at selling, you must be doing some of them uh, in some shape or form. Uh, my first boss, the, the woman that taught me everything about trading. Now that I'm reflecting on it, she naturally did all of those things. She used all of those principles without even thinking about it. And I think this is what uh, great salesmen do. I mean, they pull those levers and they use their, those principles uh, without even knowing it. So that's it for me today. I hope that you liked the video. Again, if you are interested in learning more about uh, sales in commodity trading, there is uh, a link in the description below this video. And yeah, let me know in the comment what you think. Ta ciao.